I know that I speak for everyone here at the university when I say that we are grateful for the opportunity we all have today to learn about Haiti's plans for rebuilding its education sector. As Haiti moves forward with this crucial re rebuilding process, the country will need support from its partners in planning for the country's short and long-term education needs. But it is in our support for educational restructuring that we have the rare opportunity to bring about positive and enduring change for Haiti's youth and their futures. To this end, I am also pleased to announce that this is not the last event that the George Washington University will be sponsoring. In fact, GW will be hosting a Day for Haiti on April 12th in collaboration with the consortium of DC-based universities. GW will be convening a panel of experts from around the country to educate participants on Haiti and to galvanize further support for the country's effort to rebuild. While it will surely take a great deal of time, energy, and resources for Haiti to recover from this devastating earthquake that struck just a short while ago, this is a new and rare opportunity for the government and the people of Haiti to address their development challenges with renewed vigor and a strong sense of purpose. Today, we are here to focus on education. I am proud to introduce our panel of speakers. Mr. Paul Vallis, superintendent of the Recovery School District, is currently leading efforts in New Orleans to rebuild, rebuild schools. Known for implementing sweeping district-wide reforms into nationally recognized models for reform, Mr. Vallis is now redesigning New Orleans schools with a standardized curriculum, an extended school day and school year, modernized classrooms, and improved technologies such as interactive whiteboards in classrooms and lap laptops for teachers. Mr. Vallis, please have a seat. Let me also introduce Ms. Christina Vedekul. Ms. Vedekul is the Director of the Office of the Director General at the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency, also known as CIDA, S-I-D-A. Ms. Vedekul coordinated the Swedish response to tsunami reconstruction in Indonesia from 2005 to 2006. This included field work as well as strategic work. She collaborated with the Agency for the Reconstruction multilateral and bilateral donors, as well as civil society. She also represented Sweden in the steering committee for the Multi-Donor Fund, a group representing more than 15 donors. Welcome and please have a seat, Ms. Vedekul. <laughs> Our final panelist, Mr. Joel Dis... I'm always getting this wrong, I don't speak French. <laughs> Derosé Jean-Pierre, who serves as the Minister of National Education in the Ministry of Education and Professional Training in Haiti. He has served in various posts in the education over the past decade. Mr. Jean-Pierre was the Director of the Cabinet of Ministers of National Education and later served as the General Director over that division. Mr. Jean-Pierre coordinated a national team of experts to craft the national strategy, Education for All. Prior to occupying the post of Minister of National Education, he served as an education and cultural uh, officer in the office of the Prime Minister. Mr. Jean-Pierre holds a master's degree in rural economics and management from the University of Laval in Canada. We're all looking forward to hearing your thoughts on this. Please, Mr. Jean-Pierre. And finally, I am pleased to introduce our moderator uh, and a dear friend and colleague, Dr. Joel Gomez. Dr. Joel Gomez, the Associate Dean for Research with the George Washington University's Graduate School of Education and Human Development, will moderate this morning's discussion. Dr. Gomez also serves as the Director of the Institute of Education Studies and the Center for Study of Language and Education. His areas of interest include equity, excellence in education, and diversity issues in education. Dr. Gomez recently co-edited co -edited a publication, Global Perspectives on Multilingualism, Unity in Diversity. He has experience in implementing large-scale 
sponsored programs, training, and technical assistance, conducting national and international programmatic evaluations, curriculum development, and teaching at the university and public school level. Thank you all for being with us today, Dr. Gomez. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Uh, we're very honored to, uh, to have our distinguished uh, speakers, and um, we will um, have our speakers uh, make their presentations. Uh, we will hold any questions until all three speakers have made their presentations. Then uh, you can be thinking of some questions uh, so that um, uh, we have mics at either end of the room, and you can come forth and make your, your questions. Uh, we will start with, uh, with Paul Ballas. Thank you. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let me start off by just making a, a general statement that if you look uh, over the last 50 years at the countries that have uh, s experienced accelerated development, Singapore, Ireland, et cetera, and, and other countries that have not, uh, uh, the primary reason is the failure to develop a a uh, adequate publicly funded, not necessarily publicly managed, but publicly funded educational institutions. Uh, as a result of that, uh, uh, these countries have not been able to develop the human capital so critical to development. And you can do all sorts of comparisons of countries that had similar per capita incomes, similar literacy rates, et cetera, in the 1960s and look 50 years later, and th the dramatic changes are all rooted in the failure to invest uh, in publicly funded school systems. So, the challenge for Haiti is, is, is really a challenge that's, that's being faced by uh, so many countries, so many underdeveloped countries on all the continents, but obviously those challenges are magnified uh, as a result of the, uh, uh, you know, of the uh, uh, earthquake. Uh, and of course the opportunity for Haiti uh, is, is to do something that could perhaps serve as a model for other developing countries. So clearly the things are, uh, uh, there, uh, there are, are great opportunities and great expectations here. I'd like to focus on six things. I'm going to make a reference to New Orleans, but I really want to talk about the, uh, six things we're doing in New Orleans, and I, I believe six things that are critical to creating uh, a adequate, uh, if not superior, publicly funded school system that models of which, a model of which could be used in developing countries, uh, in Haiti as well as other developing countries. First is the, the embrace of what I refer to as multiple education management models. Uh, in other words, uh, if you look at a, a, a country like Haiti, 80% uh, of the children are educated uh, in non-public uh, schools or not traditional schools. Uh, uh, working, uh, publicly funding those schools, whether they're public or parochial, whether they're private schools, uh, would, allow, would allow you to begin to uh, improve the standards, uh, the quality of those schools, while at the same time uh, giving more and more children access to those educational opportunities. Because the educational systems in so many of these developing countries, uh, lack of standards and lack of access. I think the First Lady articulated so beautifully in, in her presentation, of course, that half a million, half the children uh, in that certain age group, not being in school is an absolute, is, is an absolute uh, disaster and tragedy that needs to be addressed. But in effect, creating a system of publicly funded schools, regardless of the management models and who's running those schools, is a way of, of, of um, improving the standards, improving the quality, while at the same time expanding access. Second thing is human capital. In so many developing countries, uh, the lack uh, of a well-trained, uh, educational workforce uh, uh, actually dooms uh, many of these schools to failure. I think the First Lady articulated the large percentage of uh, teachers who barely have a ninth grade education. Uh, one of the things that we did in New Orleans uh, and when we rebuilt the schools, because we didn't rebuild the old system, we in fact uh, created a new system, was to dramatically expand the pool of individuals we were recruiting to be teachers uh, so that we would ha bring in the best and the brightest, regardless of whether they were coming to us through the traditional colleges of education. As a result, we dramatically increased the number of qualified individuals. There are, I believe, I think 35,000 uh, 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 individuals in Haiti, higher education systems, who have now been displaced. Uh, I would bet that the overwhelming vast majority of those individuals are probably better educated and more highly qualified than the l majority of the teachers who are actually teaching in the schools. A 
opening, opening the ranks uh, to those individuals and training those individuals to be teachers would be one way to close the human capital gap that exists in so many schools. Uh, the third thing is, is standardization. I'm, you know, I'm a firm believer that uh, you can institutionalize excellence through, the, for, through their development of uh, national standards and through your development of standardized curriculum instructional models. And you can develop uh, a national curriculum or work to improve the existing national curriculum and give that national curriculum portability so that it can be communicated to students. So in effect, you can create a curriculum that can be delivered uh, by even weak teachers or teachers who do, do not have sufficient skills. And it can be delivered through multiple mediums. So my experience in multiple districts, both Chicago and Philadelphia and New Orleans, has been, uh, has been in, in demonstrating uh, the superior, uh, that a superior uh, quality comprehensive instructional management system can actually institutionalize instructional excellence uh, in even some of the most uh, challenging, school, uh, challenging schools. So developing uh, and improving upon such a national curriculum and making the national curriculum available to all the schools, be they private or public, with the training that goes with it and designing the curriculum so it can be communicated in multiple mediums. Is, is, a way to, uh, is a way to institutionalize excellence. I'll be very quick. Um, the fourth thing is, is classrooms. Uh, there are ways to create a classroom learning environment that can be a superior learning environment even if that classroom is in an inadequate building. Uh, if you go to New Orleans today and you look at the schools that we've opened in modular, in trailers and in modular uh, uh, school buildings, all those classrooms are highly modernized with their classroom libraries and their smart boards and their laptop computers and their multiple mediums. Now, obviously, uh, the, the challenges in Haiti are great, but the bottom line is establishing classrooms that have that type of mobility so they can be, so wherever that classroom exists, uh, uh, that classroom can be a superior learning environment is a way to provide students with access uh, to uh, a quality learning environment irregardless of the condition of the buildings, although we could, we could talk about obviously the need to standardize the design of the buildings. Two other things that are critically important. Uh, in New Orleans, the state created a, a district to manage the rebuilding of the schools. Uh, so that uh, there, was a, there was a task force, uh, referred to as the Recovery School District, to manage the, the schools uh, that had been uh, destroyed and closed because of the hurricane. Um, most of the schools were, were, were severely neglected prior to the hurricane. About half the schools were severely damaged so that it's unlikely they'll ever be reopened uh, post-Katrina. So the creation of a single authority uh, that would then come up with a, with, with a singular plan for the opening of schools uh, allowed us to bring accountability to the system and allowed us to facilitate the quick action in rebuilding the schools. And then finally, the plan itself. Uh, uh, the more complicated the problems that we face, the simpler the plan. And it's only when plans become complicated that people become confused and, and the little, uh, you know, the little, uh, uh, the, you know, the, uh, uh, the citadels begin to become reinforced. Uh, education is not a complicated business. Uh, you diversify the management models, you expand your pool of qualified teachers, you develop superior curriculum instructional models with the training that goes with it, you come up with basic classroom modern, modern, modernization designs that can be implemented regardless of the condition of the facility, and you create a delivery system to go in and implement these things, and believe me, this is not rocket science, <laughs> but, but if you establish a simplified plan, and if you create the infrastructure within the Ministry of Education in order to implement that plan, you will do two things. The first thing you will do is you will ensure that the resources that are being allocated, however considerable, uh, will, be, will be spent in the most cost-effective way. The second thing you would do, and this is based on my New Orleans experience, is you will sustain the goodwill that is already being exhibited uh, currently. Uh, about two years ago, many of the foundations and many of the groups that had come down to New Orleans were actually thinking of moving on to other things. And since the, since the reforms that have been implemented, in, in many respects, uh, through the leadership of Senator Mary Landrieu, uh, the reforms that have been implemented, the foundations, the universities, there have been so many groups that have now come back to New Orleans or have agreed to stay in New Orleans long term. So we're at a point where we have an abundance of human capital and there's an abundance of goodwill. 
of individuals wanting to come and to support us. So, you know, these are, these are six, six basic concepts which I believe, uh, many of which are, are going to be embodied in the plan, but which need to be embodied in, in, in any educational recovery plan. And I think there's, there's lessons here, obviously, not only in the redevelopment uh, and the rebuilding of Haiti, but there are lessons here for developing, or I should say for underdeveloped countries uh, all over the hemisphere. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, for your comments, uh, Superintendent of Schools, Paul Vallas. Uh, you are indeed uh, a good leader. Uh, you have worked as a practitioner in a, in a city, in a school district with similar needs. And uh, we have much to learn from your experience. And thank you very much for your comments.